So life is service. That's the motto here at Cornell University School of Hotel Administration. And it's that spirit of service that attracted me to this program. In August of 2016, when I arrived on campus, I started taking classes in Arabic, just as something to challenge myself. And later that month in September, I found an internship working in the Middle East. I was going to be doing research with Syrian refugees and entrepreneurship. And so in March of 2017, I decided that since I was going to be working with Syrian refugees, it would make sense to help them while we were there. And so I took it upon myself to start a charity campaign. And I fundraised thousands of dollars to help Syrian refugees while doing this internship that I was planning on. But in early May, I found out that my internship had been canceled because of funding issues, um, which wasn't, you know, kind of threw me off guard a little bit. But I decided I was still going to go to Jordan anyways, and I was still going to help Syrian refugees. And so two weeks later, I bought a plane ticket to Amman, and all because life is service. I wanted to follow through with it. On June 19th, I boarded that plane to the Middle East. I was traveling alone. I had no friends with me. I wasn't part of a program. I didn't have an organization or an internship waiting for me. Um, I was a broke college student, barely spoke any Arabic, uh, never been to the Middle East before. It was definitely me stepping out of my comfort zone. Um, at the time, the Middle East, and Jordan in particular, wasn't necessarily considered one of the safest places to be traveling alone as an American with blonde hair, blue eyes, white guy, um, kind of stuck out. My parents were not too thrilled about it, but I decided I was going to do it. And so on June 20th, I landed at Queen Alia International Airport in Amman, Jordan at 3 o'clock in the morning. And as you would expect, as I was passing through the airport, getting all these weird looks from people. What's this random American doing here? But I met a young man who offered to give me a free ride to Amman and offered to host me in his home for free. And so me being the broke college student, I got in his car. <laughs> and when I got to his home at 4 o'clock in the morning, I realized why it was free. It's because you know, I was living in the third world. And I had just finished an entire year in the freshman dorms, the infamous Low Rise Six. But <laughs> this home made Low Rise Six feel like the Taj Mahal, so kind of change of uh, experience for me. His family was very traditional. I practiced Ramadan with them. I prayed in the mosques with them. I celebrated the holy holidays with them. But at the end of the day, they were strangers to me, and I didn't know if I could trust them. You know, I wasn't sure if when I came back after leaving the house, all my possessions, my passport money would be gone. Um, but ultimately, I was there to focus on the refugees. And so I set that aside, and I was networking with nonprofits. And I was able to find an opportunity to work on a refugee camp. And the project I was working on was transforming an underutilized structure into a functional school for 65 Syrian children at this camp. It was a great experience. This camp was located in Sabha, Jordan, which is in northern Jordan, in the desert, just two kilometers south of the Syrian border. So I was as close to it as you can get. And this camp was very dire. Okay, The people there were struggling. When I visited this camp, it was dusty. It was arid. You know, I saw kids with dirty clothes and broken sandals. I saw tents strewn around, not camping tents, but tents made of canvas and tarp with the UN stamped across. I saw people cooking out of fire pits for all of their meals. I saw clothes hanging on lines. This was something that I'd only seen on TV or in pictures, and now I was seeing it in real life. I spoke to the people as well, and when I spoke with the parents, you know, they shared with me the worries that they felt for their kids and their family and their futures. And I want to put you in their shoes for a moment here. Think back to where you were five years ago. Think of who you were and where you were in your life. And imagine that at that moment in your life, that was the last time you ever spoke to your family, your friends, and your neighbors. You had no idea whether they were dead or alive. You had no idea where they were. For five years, zero contact. Now let's go one step further. 
Think of somebody very dear to you in your life, maybe someone sitting next to you. Imagine that five years ago, the last thing you ever heard about them was that they had been captured by ISIS. Do you think that would worry you? While at the camp, I also spoke with the children, and I played with them. It was a great experience, but there was this time when they were telling me about their dreams and their aspirations, and they shared with me that they wanted to become doctors and lawyers, teachers, businessmen, businesswomen, you know, all dreams and passions similar to what we want in our lives. And I just, I had this pit in my stomach because while they were sharing this with me, I was wondering in the back of my mind whether they would actually be able to achieve those dreams. I was just thinking about all the obstacles they had in front of them. You know, these children, they were focusing on their survival day to day. You know, we have the luxury and the fortune of focusing on our dreams and pursuing our passions because we don't have to worry about our survival day to day. And, you know, I was just thinking about this, despite their circumstances and these terrible stories I was hearing, you know, they were some of the happiest people that I'd ever met. They had great, pleasant demeanors. And it kind of caused this internal crisis inside of me because I had these mixed emotions. On one hand, I wanted to feel bad for them. And I felt like I should feel bad for them. And, you know, I did feel bad for them. But I also felt great being around them. You know, they were fun people. And they joked around. And, you know, their, their energy was contagious. And so being around them wasn't an unpleasant experience for me. And, you know, this, this dichotomy of feelings kind of got me thinking back to my life here at home. Um, particularly at school. And, you know, I wondered, we have pretty nice lives here. You know, objectively speaking, we're at an Ivy League school. We've got air conditioning. We've got the internet, electricity. We've got great food. We've got elevators, thank goodness. Um, you know, we've got these great things. But we get so caught up in school and grades we get so caught up in work, job offers, clubs, social commitments, you know, it overwhelms us. And often, when I look around on campus, I see people who just look miserable. And sometimes I feel miserable too, to be honest. But why is that? Why do we feel miserable given our circumstances? And I know what you're thinking, it's the weather here in Ithaca. <laughs> but I'm getting at something different. You know, I was, think about two groups of people on different sides of the world who have different living circumstances, and why do they handle adversity so differently, right? They have the opposite reaction to adversity than one would expect. And I think where we differ are our mindsets. And so I wanna share with you three ideas about our mindsets that hopefully can help us handle adversity like a Syrian refugee would. So the first idea is to accept your circumstances and focus on what you can believe in. Focus on what you can control, sorry. And to go along with this point, I wanna share with you the story of a man named Hamza. I met Hamza on this camp. He was a father. Before the war, he had successfully secured a visa for his entire family, right? He was preparing to move to America, he was gonna live the American dream, and everything was gonna be great. He made it. But before he was able to board that flight and head to the US, the war broke out. And because of that war, his visa had been revoked. And so he was stuck in Syria, and rather than dwelling on this terrible timing or misfortune, you know, this bad luck that was completely out of his control. He recognized the danger that was around him. He focused on his family. And he did what was necessary to escape Syria, escape the violence, take his family to Jordan, find a refugee camp, and begin providing for them. And since being at the camp, he's recently had a daughter. She was born with Down syndrome, which presents more challenges for Hamza but he loves her and he doesn't focus on those challenges. 
what one might even call a burden. Rather, he is focused on what he can do to create a better life for her. And when I was sitting in Hamza's tent, and he was sharing with me all of these things, and I, I could see his kids there, you know, I couldn't help but just feel bad for Hamza because I was just thinking the whole time, what if? You know, what if Hamza had made it? You know, what if his daughter was in America right now? What if the war had been just a little later? But Hamza wasn't worried about the what if. He focused on what he needed to do to help his family. And because of that, his family was better off. And so what I learned from Hamza is that self-pity or wallowing will just immobilize you. It subjects you to your circumstances. But if you redirect that frustration on productive outcomes, you can change the quality of your life within your circumstances. And so my second point, do not place happiness in superficial measures, but rather find happiness through people. Okay, from a material standpoint, these refugees have nothing. Okay, there are 16-year-old kids that don't know what a smartphone is. You know, husbands can't take their wives out to dinner. There's no Netflix to come home to after a long day. And there's no Starbucks to even begin your day. So these, from a material standpoint, these refugees have very different lives than us. And yet, they're happy people. They find happiness in the people around them. They love each other. They love their community. They loved me, who just visited them. And you can see how happy they were. Now, when I think about my life, or some of those in the audience, those around, do we find happiness in the people around us? Or are we focused on possessions, status, Instagram likes, fun, or the fear of missing out on fun? Is it these things that we try to draw our happiness from? Or is it the people around us? Because the people around us are what will help us get through the tough times and will magnify the good times. The third point. Overcome negative emotion through the power of gratitude. I met another young father who was a refugee, a refugee from Iraq. He was barely older than I was. He had this large dent in his forehead that I could tell had just recently healed over. He explained to me that what had happened was men had stormed into his home and had knocked him out with the butt of an AK-47. While he was unconscious, they kidnapped him, his entire family. They slaughtered his family, executed all of them. When he came back to consciousness and realized what had happened, he escaped his captors, he found his wife and his baby daughter, he took them out of Iraq and fled to Jordan. And when I found him in Jordan, he was living in squalor, he was working in squalor, but he was alive. And his wife was alive. And his daughter was alive. And when he spoke about his daughter and the hopes that he had for his daughter, he had this big smile on his face, this big grin. And I realized that the power of gratitude is real. Gratitude is a powerful concept, a powerful tool that we can use to replace those bad feelings that are harbored within us. Pain, sorrow, injustice, those can be overcome when we think about the things we're grateful for in our life. This man, he had intense anguish from the death of his family. You could see it in his eyes when you spoke with him. And yet, he coped with it by thinking about his daughter and the life that he had with his wife. And it was this mindset that he had that truly changed the quality of his being. And so that's why today I'm not offering three steps or three tricks, three actions or behaviors or habits. Really what I'm offering are three ideas. Ideas about our mindset. In fact, I had this transformative experience in my life. I came back to America. 
And I didn't do anything different outwardly. Didn't do anything different. And yet, I had a new way of looking at my life. A new way of looking at my circumstances and my challenges and my future. It was this new way of viewing my life that changed how I feel about my life. And that empowered me to be happier during the good times and less troubled during the bad times. And so, even though I feel as if I was able to help those refugees temporarily, I honestly feel as if, through these lessons, those refugees have changed me permanently. Thank you. <laughs>